And thank you all for coming back after lunch. It's so nice to see a full room of people who want to learn about analysis. It makes me very happy. Um, so this morning at Plenary, I showed um, a space-time analysis of that outage data in Houston. So we first looked at a 2D cluster analysis, and then we aggregated that into 3D so that we could incorporate time as the third dimension. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that and how it works. If I just jump back over here to Pro, we can see that um, this is kind of, you can imagine the aggregation as this sort of 3D cube where um, each one of these bins, as you go closer to the top, you get more recent in time, and the ones at the bottom are farthest back in time. So if I jump back into the slides, we can take a look at how this works. So let's see if my clicker will work here. All right. So I first want to start talking about this concept of turning data into information. Uh, I think we mentioned this a lot during plenary through different sessions, and it's a really important concept to be aware of and to kind of think about. Um, I want to propose this idea through this example. So here I have a map of 911 calls in Baltimore, Maryland. So this is a lot of data. I have a lot of points on this map. But I would kind of venture to say that we don't really have information yet, right? So if we were to look at a spreadsheet of, let's say, 100,000 numbers, nobody really just looks at a spreadsheet and then understands something, right? We look at a spreadsheet, maybe we'll look at the, the average of a set of numbers or the standard deviation, the maximum number, the minimum number. We never just look at a set of numbers and then understand something. We have to do a little bit more to digest that into information. So. I would venture to say that just taking those 100,000 points and putting them on the map, we have a little bit more information. We know that they're all in Baltimore, but that's about it. I can't really tell if there are any patterns, if there are any clusters, if there are any trends. I don't know where to focus my attention, where to focus my resources. There could be hundreds of points stacked in the same spot, and there would be no way of telling. So just putting your points on the map is a great first step, but it's just the first step. We need to do more to turn that data, that spatial data, into information that we can make decisions off of. So one common thing to do would be to um, create a density surface, like this one. And now we do have a, a better understanding of this data. We see that we have more 911 calls in the red areas and fewer in the blue areas. So I made this map, and I have a little bit better understanding, but then I made this map. And now it looks like the problem is much more severe, right? The map on the right makes it look like we have a lot more 911 calls than the map on the left. But if you guys are, have ever made a map before, maybe you know where I'm going with this. These are actually the exact same data. I ran the density surface one time, and I just classified it in two different ways. So the map on the left, I use a natural breaks classification system. So to be the darkest red, you just have to be above about 8,800. And the map on the right, I used a quantile classification. And to be the darkest red, you only have to be above about 2,000. So neither map is wrong. Neither map is lying to you. They both display exactly what the legend says. But most people are not really familiar with this concept of how subjective creating a map like this might be. Um, if I were a police chief, let's say, for example, and these were crime maps, and I wanted more money in my budget next year, I might show the map on the right and say, look, the crime problem is really severe. I really need some more help, but we need more money in the budget. Let's say I was that same police chief, and the following year I had received the money. I wanted to prove that I had used, put the money to good use. I might show the map on the left and say, look at this. I solved the problem of crime in Baltimore. But we as map makers know that these are the same maps, just classified in a different way. So there's a lot of subjectivity involved in how you visualize your data. And so I would like to introduce a couple of ways that we can minimize that subjectivity through spatial statistics. So here, this result is the result of a hotspot analysis. And you might be thinking, OK, well, there's red on the map and there's blue on the map. How is that any less subjective? 
And it's less subjective because we are now using inferential statistics to determine what the darkest red is and what the darkest blue is. So the darkest red areas, or the dark red areas in general, are clusters of high values. The blue areas are clusters of low values. And we use inferential statistics to determine that. So the null hypothesis for complete for, for inferential statistics is always complete spatial randomness. So we want to know, is the pattern that we're seeing random or not? Because the random pattern, we can't really do anything about that, right? It's just random. We could throw a whole bunch of resources at it, but it's not going to change anything because randomness does not have a cause. But if a pattern is not random, then we know there's some underlying process causing that pattern to take place and then we can begin investigating why that pattern is taking place and perhaps we can predict where that pattern is gonna go in the future. So to kind of illustrate this point, let's take a look at 45 of my favorite random numbers. Let's say we were to pick these up, shake them up and drop them. Now you don't need to know anything about spatial statistics or about probability theory to just kind of intuitively sense, you just kind of feel it in your gut that it would be really unlikely that all the high numbers just happen to fall together right here, right? We just kind of intuitively know that's not random. But it's not always quite that obvious. So with something like a hotspot analysis, what we're asking is, what are the chances that this happened randomly? And so we're asking, what's the probability? So we use z-scores and p-values. A z-score is basically just a standard deviation, so how far from the average value is the feature. And a p-value is a probability. So at um, the right side of the tail here, a p-value of 0.01 means we can be 99% confident that a feature belongs to a non-random cluster of high values. We can also be 95 or 90% confident that a feature belongs to a cluster of high values. And then the same on the other side. With a very negative z-score, we can be 99, 95, or 90% confident that a feature belongs to a non-random cluster of low values. And so now when we look at that map, we can kind of understand a little bit better where those colors came from. I didn't just kind of arbitrarily classify this to decide what's gonna be red and what's gonna be blue. The red things are associated with the z-scores and the p-values. So high z-scores with low p-values are considered statistically significant clusters of high values. And the low values with very low z-scores and low p-values are significant clusters of low values. And I wanted to just take a moment here to differentiate a hotspot analysis from a heat map. Those are commonly confused and that's understandable because they're both talking about temperatures and maps. Um, but a heat map is what we saw earlier. It's just, it's a density surface. So we have that subjectivity involved in how we render that density surface. A hotspot analysis is not a density surface. It's a statistical test for randomness. So I'm not saying that you guys should not create heat maps or that there's something wrong with heat maps or core plus maps or thematic maps. I'm just saying that it's really important to be aware of that subjectivity because if you've never made a map before, if you create one of these maps and you give it to a decision maker who has never themselves made a map before, they're just gonna have an emotional reaction to that bright red heat map or a different reaction to the lighter one um, when in fact they're the same data. So we kind of have a lot of power and responsibility in how we um, you know, render these maps. And something like a hotspot analysis can help to quantify patterns so that we can be less subjective. So we looked at how this works um, in space. Oh, we're using the Geddes or GI star statistic for hotspot analysis. So this is not something that Ezri just made up. This is a well-documented statistic that we've just implemented in an easy to use way um, in our software. So we've talked a lot about space, but we also wanna talk about time, right? I showed you the temporal analysis and, and the plenary. And we can include time by kind of extending what we think of as a proximity to not just be what's near you in space, but also what's near you in time. 
So one common way of looking at temporal data would be something like this, like creating a snapshot. So we create one map for January 2015, one for January 2016, and then kind of just visually compare them, kind of go back and forth. It does kind of look like maybe January 2015 has more calls than 2016, but just a visual comparison is not enough. We can't quantify the differences. We can't quantify the patterns. Another common method is something like this, an animation, where you can just kind of turn points on and off over time. And people love this, and maybe it's kind of cool, but I would argue that it's basically useless. I mean, can you guys tell where things are getting worse or what's trending or what might happen next? Probably not. Um, so with uh, the space-time tools, we're kind of extending this first law of geography that states that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things, to say kind of everything is related to everything else, but near and recent things are more related than distant things. So if you think about it, there could have been a crime that happened right over here 10 years ago, and one that happened down the street yesterday. The one that happened down the street yesterday is a lot farther from me in space than the one that happened right here, but it's so much closer to me in time that it's probably more related to me than the one that happened right here 10 years ago, right? So now we can define proximity in space and in time. And we do this by aggregating into what we call a space-time cube. So traditionally, with the non-temporal data, we just aggregate using a grid on the ground with an X and a Y. But with the temporal data, you can kind of imagine it like this. Time is the third dimension. And we can aggregate into what we call a space-time cube. So in this example here, we're looking at a cube where the grid on the ground is 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, and then one month increments going up. So we see that little peekaboo over there. That's what happened in just in the month of May in that one location on the ground. And once we have these uh, incidents aggregated into the space-time cube, then we can start applying some of these methods, like a hotspot analysis, in 3D. So we call that an emerging hotspot analysis. And an emerging hotspot analysis looks at all of your features and relationship to their neighbors in both space and time to determine if each one of those bins belongs to a cluster of high values, a cluster of low values, or if it's just a random pattern. So you can kind of imagine the result something like this. But I think that just looking at the 3D um, bins in space is not really easy enough to understand, right? Like you could have millions of these bins and you'd have to kind of fly around through Pro, which is pretty cool. but. In order to understand this, we also digested it into a 2D output as well. So we have 16 different categories of significance here. And I'll go through a couple of them with you. So right here is what we, what we have is called a sporadic hotspot, which means it was hot in the most recent time period. And then it's kind of been like not significant hot, not significant hot, kind of back and forth over time. Or something like this, which is a new hotspot. So it's never been hot before until the most recent time period. So that's kind of like an alert, right? Something is starting to happen here. You should take notice. We also have what we call an intensifying hotspot, which means that location has been hot at least 90% of the time, and that Z-score is getting more and more intense. So that location is getting hotter and hotter and hotter as time goes on. So you might predict that next time it's going to be even hotter because the problem is getting worse. Um, we also have something called an oscillating hotspot where it kind of goes cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot over time. So really, this is most useful when you combine the 2 and 3D outputs to investigate the results of the analysis. If I just gave you that 3D cube, it would be kind of hard to make any sense out of it. If I just gave you the 2D output, you wouldn't really know what kind of pattern necessarily fell in each one of these, like an oscillating hotspot. You wouldn't know how many times it went back and forth from hot to cold, for example. So with Pro, you can actually look at a map in 2D and a scene in 3D at the same time and investigate. So we kind of say like the, the, 3D, the 2D is the answer and the 3D is the evidence. 
So if I see a spot that's intensifying, I might identify that spot in the 3D scene and then look, okay, now this makes sense to me. I can see that it's been getting hotter over time. And so here's the result of that um, merging hotspot analysis for the 911 calls. We see the 2D output and the 3D output. So the 2D output, it looks like we have some intensifying hotspots. Those are the ones with the kind of gradient looking um, squares in the middle there, which means that the z-score is getting more and more intense. It's getting hotter and hotter. And then around the outside, we have some um, intensifying cold spots, which means they're getting colder and colder over time. And we can investigate that through our 3D map. So I think that we are running close to time. Um, I just wanted to show you again really quickly in Pro the result here. So I have this 2D result and I just cut out um, the new hotspots here to show this example. So you can see kind of that evidence, right? It's new for the first time. It's, it's a hotspot for the first time in 18 months. And looking at the 3D, now it makes sense to me. It's actually been cold in the past, but hot for the very first time. Same on this other side. Um, it used to be a cold spot and then recently it became hot. So something that's changed there and now we, we have an alert to kind of pay attention to those areas. Um, so that's kind of a quick tour of uh, hot spot analysis in 2 and 3D. And I'd be happy to take some questions. We have about five minutes. Anybody have any questions? So that's a good question. Um, we use that Z value as, the, as time. And so right now, there's no way to input an actual height for a Z value because it's uncommon that we have that kind of data that's in 3D space. Um, but we do occasionally have data like that for um, things underwater or things in the air. So that is something that we are thinking about including. And there are other ways of kind of fudging that. So you could give it like a time dummy variable as your third dimension. Um, but right now, really, it's just uh, focused on time. Anybody else? Yes. Whether it's sporadic, sorry, whether it's uh, sporadic or, you know, uh, a, a, a new hotspot, uh, those parameters, are they able to be changed or are they fixed? That's also a really good question. So right now, they're fixed. Um, but we have thought about making them more flexible in the future, like because right now we say, okay, to be intensifying, you have to be significant at least 90% of the time. So maybe for you, 80% of the time would be enough, and it, it would count as something else. It would be in a different category if um, we left it with our classification. So right now, there's no easy kind of way to manually change that, but the tool is written in Python, so all of these Python tools, you can actually look at the code and you could tweak that if you wanted to. If you were brave enough to, and if you had the knowledge of, of how to um, work in Python, just really recommend that you make a copy of the original script before you go and change things. Um, but I think that in the future, we'll kind of give you some flexibility there if you want to tweak those parameters before the output comes out. And also, oftentimes we get the results, um, and sometimes you know that legend is can, kind of overwhelming. If you're giving this map to a decision maker, they're gonna look at 16 categories and be like, get out of here, this doesn't make any sense to me. So you can kind of reclassify that to make sense for whatever analysis that you're running. So we had some examples looking at um, deforestation. And so they grouped a whole bunch of the categories together, like intensifying, diminishing, persistent, and consistent uh, hotspots. They're like, that means it's been hot 90% of the time, we don't care if it's been going up or down. They just lumped that as one color and gave it a new legend. So you can also kind of reinterpret our 16 categories if those are too many um, for, your, for your results or for your decision makers. Can I, are, we, are we out of time? Can I ask a question? Oh. Is that all right? Um, can you do this in ArcMap? Um, yes and no. So uh, <laughs> the emerging hotspot analysis tool and the Create Space Time Cube tool are available in ArcMap. Um, but as we're up, uh, adding more functionality, like now you don't have to aggregate to just a, a, a grid or a hexagon anymore. You can also aggregate to your own polygons. That has not been backported to ArcMap. 
So I think that ArcMap is kind of going to stand still and Pro is going to keep growing. Also in ArcMap, it's really hard to visualize in 2 and 3D. You'd have to create, um, you have to use Arc Globe or Arc Scene, and that's a little bit, more, a lot more complicated actually than looking at it in Pro. So you can run an emerging hotspot analysis, but it's harder to visualize and you don't have the, the new opportunities that we're including to use your own polygons and defined locations. I think we had a question in the back. I'm sorry, say that again? Oh. So you can set you can set a transparency to the three D cube. So the, the cube that I had in this demo, um, we call that uh, real world space. So you can't fly through it. But if I had set it to screen space, as you get closer, the columns get skinnier so that you can actually kind of see through them. I think that might be in one of the slides, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, kind of. You can kind of tell in these slides that like, if I were to zoom in, those columns would stay the same size, so you could kind of see around them. Um, but we also have different ways of using a range slider and a time slider to kind of cut through the cube, but you can use transparency as well. We, we kind of played around with making the non-significant bins transparent, but then it kind of got disorienting because in 3D, it's you know, it's still it's still a 2D screen displaying a 3D um, scene. So we found that it was easier to kind of navigate with the opacity uh, to 100%. But you're definitely able to change that, play around with it. Uh, yeah. Can you please apply uh, dynamic filters to these to the hotspot analysis that you have made, so that, for example, if we figure if we isolate certain 911 call and the hotspot will build dynamically again, or you have to build it from scratch, or? I'm sorry, can you repeat yeah. the question? Yeah, um, suppose that the 911 calls have like many categories. Now you are doing the hotspots for the all categories, all, all, all in one. Can you apply like, for example, one category of 911 hotspot, uh, of 911, and then you can build the hotspot analysis again? Um, I think, if I understand you correctly, you're yeah. asking if you can do a hotspot analysis on different um, attributes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So when you aggregate into the space-time cube, um, the default is for it to just count how many incidents fell in each bin. But like I showed earlier in the plenary demo, I actually did a sum of the outage minutes and an average of the outage minutes. So I got three variables in my cube at the same time. So the cube already has that information in it. I would have to run emerging hotspot analysis three times, but on the same cube. So I wouldn't have to keep aggregating over and over. The cube can store multiple um, attributes and multiple results at the same time. I think we have one more here. Probably the last question. Okay, last one. I'll also yep. be at the networking reception later so I can continue answering questions. Uh, you mentioned just before uh, using the time slider with um, the, the tool. Yes. Um, does the symbology change dynamically with time as well, if you did change that? Um, so the, the time slider really just kind of removes the bins that are not in the time field that is specified. So they will just disappear. So you could either kind of look at one slice at a time, or you could do cumulative so that the ones below stay and you just add one on top of the other. The, the color of the bins won't change, but the ones that are not in your time range will not be visible while you're in that range, if that makes any sense. Cool, thank you guys a lot. We have another session coming up, so I'm gonna hand this back over, but I will see you guys at the networking reception and answer thank more questions then. Thank you. Thank you.